Alright, this is Canto 16 in The Purgatorio, translated by John Ciardi. It's um, about the wrathful, but the second part because Canto 15 was the first one. No gloom of hell, nor of a night allowed, no planet under its impoverished sky, the deepest dark that may be drawn by cloud, ever drew such a veil across my face, nor one whose texture rasp rasped my senses so, as did the smoke that wrapped us in that place. The sting was more than open eyes could stand. My wise and faithful guide drew near me, therefore, and let me grasp his shoulder with my hand. Just as a blind man, lest he lose his road or tumble headlong and be hurt or killed, walks at his guide's back when he goes abroad. So I moved through that foul and acrid air, led by my sweet friend's voice, which kept repeating, Take care. Do not let go of me. Take care. And I heard other voices. They seemed to pray for peace and pardon to the Lamb of God, which, of its mercy, takes our sins away. They offered up three prayers, and every one began with Agnes Dei, Lamb of God, and each word and measure rose in perfect unison. Master, do I hear spirits on this path, I said, and he to me, you do indeed, and they are loosening the knot of wrath. And who are you, then, that you cleave our smoke, yet speak of us as if you kept time by calends? Without warning, someone spoke these words to me, at which my lord and guide said, Answer, and inquire respectfully if one may find a way up on this side. And I, O spirit, growing pure and free, to go once more in beauty to your maker, you will hear wonders if you follow me. As far as, as is permitted me, he said, I will, and if the smoke divide our eyes, our ears shall serve to join us in their stead. So I began. I make my way above, still in these swathing, swathings, 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 death dissolves. I came here through the infernal grief, hell. Now since God's love encloses me in grace so bounteous that he permits me to behold his court by means unholy known to modern use, pray tell me who you were before you died, and if I go the right way to the path that leads above, your words shall be our guide. I was a Lombard. Marco was my name. I knew the ways of the world and loved that good at which the bows of men no longer aim. You are headed the right way to reach the stair that leads above, he added, and I pray you to pray for me when you have, mount when you have mounted there. And I, on my faith, I vow it. But a doubt has formed within me and has swelled so large I shall explode unless I speak it out. It was a simple doubt at first, but now it doubles and grows, and sure as I compare your words with what was said to me below. The world, as you have said, is truly bare of every trace of good, swollen with evil by evil overshadowed everywhere. But what, but wherein lies the fault? He's questioning the origin of evil? Why, why is he asking this guy and not Virgil? Or why is he asking him now and not waiting to ask Beatrice, who seems to, like, know a lot more than Virgil. Okay. Um, I'm gonna start at 58. The world, as you have said, is truly bare of every trace of good, swollen with evil, by evil overshadowed everywhere. But wherein lies the fault? I beg to know that I may see the truth, and so teach others. Some see it in the stars, some here below. Okay. A deep sigh wrung by grief, almost a moan escaped as a long ah. Then he said, Brother, the world is blind, and you are its true son. Mankind, mankind sees in the heavens alone the source of all things, good and evil. As if by law they shaped all moral actions in their course. If that were truly so, then all free will would be destroyed, and there would be no justice in giving bliss for virtue, pain for evil. The spheres do start your impulses along. I do not say all, but suppose I did. The light of reason still tells right from wrong. 
I'm gonna comment on this all later. Okay. And free will also, which, though it be strained in the first battles with the heavens, still can conquer all if it is well sustained. You are free subjects of a more immense nature and power which grants you intellect to free you from the heavens' influence. If, therefore, men today turn from God's laws, the fault is in yourselves to seek and find, and I shall truly explicate the cause. From the hand of God, whose love shines like a ray upon it, even before birth, comes forth the simple soul which, like a child at play, cries, laughs, and ignorant of every measure but the glad impulse of its joyous maker, turns eagerly to all that gives it pleasure. It tastes small pleasures first. To these it clings, deceived, and seeks no others, unless someone curb it or guide its love to higher things. Men, therefore, need restraint by law, and need a monarch over them who sees at least the towers of the true city. Laws indeed there are, but who puts nations to their proof? No one. The shepherd who now leads mankind can chew the cud, but lacks the cloven hoof. I don't know what that means. The people then, seeing their guide devour those worldly things to which their hunger turns, graze where he grazes, and ask nothing more. The bad state of the modern world is due, as you may see then, to the bad leadership and not to natural corruption in you. Rome used to shine in two suns when her rod made the world good, and each showed her its way one to the ordered world and one to God. Now one declining sun puts now one declining sun puts out the other. The sword and crook are the are one. That's referring to the Pope, by the way. We talked about that in class. The sword and crook are one, and only evil can follow from them when they are together. For neither fears for neither fears the other being one. Look closely at the ear, if you still doubt me, for by it the seed, for by the seed it bears is the plant known. Honor and courtesy once made their home in the land the Po and the Adige, Adige water, till Frederick came to loggerheads with Rome. Now any man who has good cause to fear the sound of truth or honest company may cross it safely. He will find none there. True, three old men are left in whom the past reproves the present. How time drags for them till God remove them to their joy at last. Conrad de Palazzo, the good Gerard, and Guido de Castel, who is better named in the fashion of the French, the honest Lombard. Say then that the church has sought to be two governments at once. She sinks in muck, befouling both her power and ministry. Oh, Marco mine, I said, you reason well. And now I know why Levi's sons alone could not inherit wealth in Israel. But who is this Gerard in whom you say the past survives untarnished to reprove the savage breed of this degenerate day? Your question seeks to test me, said Lombardo, or else to trick me. How can you speak Tuscan and still seem to know nothing of Gerardo? Just what his sur surname is, I do not know, unless he might be known as Gaia's father. Godspeed, this is as far as I may go. Uh, see there across the smoke like dawn's first rays the light swell like a glory and a guide the angel of this place gives forth that blaze and it is not fit he see me thus he spoke and said no more but turned back through the smoke let's pause that's the end of the chapter by the way or the canto if you want to stop watching but I have some comments so first of all Dante meets this guy named Marco, um, and basically he asks him, the world's evil, but whose fault is it that it's evil? And Marco answers, Marco answers that we see moral actions as good or evil because the heavens the heavens source these things as good or the heavens make the things good or evil so that's how we see them as good or evil that's in line 64 through 66 it seems like oh sorry um 68 through 70 
Oh no, it's not saying that. It's saying that's not the case. Heaven doesn't make things good or evil because then all free will wouldn't, like free will wouldn't exist. And if free will doesn't exist, like if everything's predetermined for us, then there's no justice in um, punishing anybody or praising anybody because they didn't actually make their own decision. Okay, so what he actually says is that heaven starts your impulses, but the light of reason still tells right from wrong. And free will can conquer, I guess, heavenly will. If, if you use your free will correctly, you are free subjects of a more immense nature and power which grants you intellect to free you from the heaven's influence. Basically, he's saying that the fault is in, your, like in us, in ourselves. If we follow God or turn from God, it's our fault, like not God's. So the cause of evil is us. And then he goes through through the account of like how that came to be. Um, we um, were born, it looks like, and we turn to pleasures. We taste small pleasures and yearn for nothing more. Um, so we need people to curb or guide our love for these pleasures into greater things like parents you know or as he says lawgivers lawmakers men therefore need restraint by law need a monarch over them who uh, who sees at least the towers of the true city i don't know why a monarch and not like a democracy or something or a republic since he is from rome and, and stuff Okay, and then, and then the kicker is um, the bad state of the modern world is due, as you may see then, to bad leadership and not to natural corruption in you. Okay, listen though, I have a theory. Leaders are people, and if people are corrupted, then the bad leadership is because of the natural corruption. So this is circular reasoning, you know. The bad state of the modern world is due to bad leadership and not to natural corruption in you but the leaders themselves have been naturally corrupted. Okay. What, what do you guys think? I mean, this is what Marco is saying. Does Dante believe it? Dante, the writer, does he believe it? And whether he does or not, is it true? Like, is the cause of every evil in this world our own internal corruption? And if we had better, like, laws or leaders, uh, would there be not hardly any corruption? Okay.